chapter happiness in Denmark from the book The Blue Zones of Happiness Lessons from the World's Happiest People by Dan Buitner. Happiness in, Derm in Denmark. Erwin Strands may seem as unlikely poster boy for Danish happiness. A bearded, ponytailed, self-described nerd who favors coiled scarves and converse tennis shoes, the 29-year-old spent his first 25 years in Latvia. There, he said, he lived in a corrupt, inefficient society, their police took bribes, doctors were overworked, and firefighters slept drunk while buildings burned, as he put it. He watched his unemployed, spiritually broken father drink himself to death. On a manager's stipend from his grandmother, he enrolled in law school while living in dorm rooms he described as, quote, worse than sleeping on a mattress under a bridge, end quote. When he realized that a law degree in Latvia would earn him either a poorly paid civil servant job or a career, quote, protecting bad people, end quote, he abandoned his studies. To save money, Irvins moved to a scotchy part of Riga, the capital of Latvia, where he regularly witnessed muggings outside his door. His true passion was computer programming, but he couldn't afford the classes. Quote, I spent a lot of time sitting alone in my room, and I always felt tired, he recalled. I'd wake up each morning thinking I have no certainty that I won't kill myself today and tomorrow might be worse. In fact, I couldn't see any tomorrow. End quote. In 2012, he met Valeria Train, red-haired Dynamo, with an appetite for elsewhere. She shared Erwin's passion for web design and 3D computer games. Like him, she had enough of Latvia and was feeling miserable. She would grown up in a school system that required her parents to pay off teachers to teach, and fellow students teased her avant-garde dress and sculpted hair. Quote, I was into the arts, and the arts are considered a silly profession there, end quote, she said. Ever since she was young, she would endure catcalls from men. She didn't feel safe on the street. She persuaded Irvins to join her in applying for foreign university. When Denmark's University of Aalborg accepted them, their lives changed forever. Aalborg is an odd little place located on a placid fjord that smells vaguely like smoked herring. For most of the past century, it was an industrial city known for cement, pig's feet, and aquavit. Somehow, though, then the European Union recently surveyed 83 of Europe's biggest cities, Alborg topped the list in almost every category that portends happy life. Alborg University deserves much of the credit. In 1970, when it shifted its focus from vocational training to the sciences, it seeded a knowledge economy. Wind power, telecommunication, microchip companies sprouted 
and thrived, along with Tetris-like sprawl of blocky buildings designed by architects who apparently enjoyed playing with Legos as children. In August 2012, Erwins and Valeria moved into one of these buildings on the outskirts of Alborg and started classes. Their student visas permitted them to hold only part-time jobs. Working 15 hours a week left them worrying about how to make ends meet, but like Danish student, Erwins and Valeria paid no tuition or health care costs. A housing stipend enabled them to rent an apartment on the edge of town, and for they couldn't afford a car, Alberg's nearly gridded bike paths and public transport made it easy for them to travel anywhere in town in minutes. Then the kicker. They discovered that Danish students are typically paid about $900 a month to go to school. Quote, my upbringing taught me to trust no one, end quote, recalled Valeria when I met her at the Love Cafe, a meeting place where immigrants from around the world share a potluck meal every Sunday night. Quote, but over time, we have made many friends here. At one point, I actually gave a friend a spare key to my house. End quote. Quote, we are uh, freakishly happy now, end quote, Erwins added, telling me that on 1 to 10 scale, his happiness jumped from a 4 in Latvia to an 8 in Denmark. Here, we are two healthy, intelligent people who only a few years earlier had been miserable with grim outlooks on life and on the verge of depression. They didn't get rich, uh, cure themselves of a terrible disease, experience great fame or recognition, see a psychologist, take happiness class, or try any tips or tricks they found in magazines. And yet they were both significantly and enduringly happier. All they did was move to Alborg. Harnessing Humility I met Erwins and Valeria on my third trip to Denmark to explore the nation's unique brand of happiness, one that seems to enable people to live a purposeful life better than anywhere else. For the past 40 years, Denmark has most dependably topped the rankings of world's happiest countries. According to World Database of Happiness, when people in Denmark are asked how much they enjoy their lives on 1 to 10 scale, their answers average 8.4. And the happiness is more evenly distributed throughout Danish society than anywhere else on the globe. Pocket Utopia If Danish trust comes from a system that takes care of you from credit to grave, then the young woman I met in the city of Alborg was the perfect person to tell me what I felt like. I met uh, Sitsi Clemenson in her kitchen when she was sipping tea. A 35-year-old working mother, she had short brown hair and wore a sleeveless blues and Moroccan slippers. Apart from the diamond stud in her nose, she looked like a soccer mom. Clemenson, her domestic partner, and two daughters, with their third child on the way, were one of the 22 families living together in a co-housing complex, a Bofels Cup, or shared home. Each family owned a small Lego-like house, but together all shared a huge garden, laundry, workshop, 
storage area, parking facility, and dining hall where they could opt into communal meals. Each of the families cooks one or two meals a month for a whole community and then eats the rest of their meals free. Perched on a low hill overlooking rolling pastures, the complex was conveniently located within a biking distance of the neighborhood, elementary school, and the local university, where Clemenson works as a researcher. Of the current families in the co-op, Clemenson said two the original owners, former 1970s hippies whose homes were now equipped with laptop computers and espresso machines. Four were single and the rest were young parents. Kids roamed the grounds and surrounding woods on their own, as likely to end up at a friend's house as their own. It was a convenient arrangement for parents who could find free childcare at the moment's notice. Residents called one another Bofellas, something more than a neighbors, but not quite friends. Clemenson said, the co-housing design allowed for privacy, but also provided nudges to socialize. Step outside and you were likely to bump into neighbors in the garden or at the washing machines. Quote, Danish co-houses are a nice in-between arrangement, providing a friendship network in individualist context, end quote, said Ruth Van Hoven. In perfectly Scandinavian fashion, they offered an elegant mix of private and public. They also seem to be an apt metaphor for Danish society as a whole, with an emphasis on trust and social support. Quote, the state provides me with everything I need, uh, Clemenson said. My children are happy. I have a great partner and I love my job. End quote. As she talked about her life, Clemenson offered me more tea and plate of watermelon. She was interrupted only by her two young daughters, who leaped into her lap for a hug and a slice of melon for themselves. It occurred to me that this manufactured community struck the perfect balance between the need for privacy and our instinctual desire for human interaction, support and trust. Denmark's happiness, according to Peters Gundelach, a sociologist at Hopenhagen University, may be traced to the Second War of Schleswig in 1864, when Denmark lost 40% of its territory and population to Prussia. Quote, with that defeat, we lost our ambition to be a world superpower, he said. It humbled us. Our government began to strengthen our national identity and build inwardly instead. End quote. During the past century and a half, the Danish government has plowed funds into generous social programs, creating a prosperous welfare state, the world's highest gross national product per capita, the highest percentage of national budget spent on child care, the lowest levels of corruption and the highest levels of trust in one another, all factors closely linked to happiness. Dan's grow up believing they have the right to health care, education, lifelong incomes. University students as Erwins and Valeria discovered uh, draw a government stipend in addition to free tuition. It takes the average university student a 
leisurely 6.6 years to graduate in Denmark, which gives students the time they need to find their vacations and hobbies that will truly satisfy them for a long term. New parents can take year-long government-paid parental leave at nearly fully salary, full salary. This includes gay lesbian parents who have been free to marry since 1986. People work hard in Denmark, but they rarely put in more than 37 hours a week or skip vacations. They price uh, for such lavish benefits is world's highest income tax rate, which starts at 42% and tops out at 68% for the biggest earners. A field uh, leveler that makes it possible for garbage men to earn more than doctors. Quote, Danish happiness is closely tied to their nation of Trickhead, the snuggled, tucked in feeling that begins with mother's love and extends to the relationship Dan's have with their government, end quote, says Jonathan Swartz, uh, an American anthropologist based in Copenhagen. Quote, the system doesn't so much assure happiness as it keeps people from doing what will make them unhappy." End quote. It may also have something to do with the Danish disdain for showiness, a throwback uh, to village life expressed by Jantelovin, a list of do's and don'ts set forth in 1933 novel uh, Fugitive Crosses, his tracks, by Axel Sandemos. You are no smarter than the rest of us, the gentleman says, so don't even try. Ambition is character flow in Denmark. You are more likely to garner respect by riding a bicycle than BMW. But in the counterintuitive world of Danish happiness, that's also a blessing. In a land where as the joke goes, the extroverted man is the one looking down at your shoes instead of his own, there is a little pressure to show off. The result? A nation in which there is a little upside to working too hard at a job you don't like for income that won't buy status. So people are more likely to pursue jobs that they love doing, work that fuels their passions. Denmark produces some of the world's greatest architects, furniture makers and chefs. Given their high taxes and modest salaries, Dan's earned filling their houses with designer furniture and eating at uh, Michelin three-star restaurants every week. But they do enjoy homegrown quality. Quote, Dance will plan a purchase for months, researching it carefully and severing the anticipation. Anders Weber of Copenhagen Journalist told me, the centerpiece of our home is an expensive table that took a month's salary and the year of planning to purchase." End quote. As Denmark's first, third largest city, Alberg trails Copenhagen and Aarhus in size, arts, and some would say ostentation, but that only makes it more perfectly Danish. It is Denmark's northmost regional capital, and here people enter long dark winters, but gather around candlelit tables and engage in conversations or play games, as much hip drama-free quality time known locally as hige. Then, 
From May through October, they migrate outside to some 62,000 summer house gardens where they grow vegetables, talk to neighbors over the hedge. Or they stroll along the Limfjord, warm of sensible shoes and subtly acknowledge each other with restrained nods, the standard greeting between those stoic dance. Eilberg possesses the additional advantage of being a medium-sized city, about 200,000 people, big enough so you can find a job, mate that suits you, but not so big that it wears you down. The size tend to be the ideal setting for happiness worldwide according to those who have studied the situation. Quote, in cities of more than 200,000 people, we see the biggest drop-off of happiness. Quote, end quote, says Adam Akulich Kozarin, an assistant professor of public policy at Rutgers University, Camden. Quote, there is too much crowding, noise, and the light pollution. It's not a social environment optimized for humans. In smaller cities, you are more likely to forge meaningful relationships. End quote. Research shows well-being is highest in places near water, with easy access to recreation or where you are likely to bump into friends and acquaintance throughout the day to get what Gallup share care surveys suggest is the optimal six hours of social interaction daily. In other words, you are more likely to be happy in a city like Aalborg. Which brings us back to Erwins and Valeria. They moved from a miserable life in Eastern Europe to a satisfying one in Aalborg. Like a vast majority of those we survey who live in Denmark, they said they feel safe, trust their fellow citizens, and think local government is efficient and helpful. Almost all of the people in Aalborg were satisfied with their financial situation as well as their life overall. It is any wonder Erwins and Valeria describe their own happiness as, quote, freakish, end quote, compared with what they knew in Latvia. Location, location, location. To find out if the simple act of moving to the happier place could really make someone happier, I tracked down John Halliwell, a Canadian economist. John is an interesting man, someone for whom a career of studying career of studying happiness has rubbed off. He spends his summers living off a grid in a cottage on British Columbia's Hornby Island next to Halliwell Provincial Park, land his family donated to the park system. He also co edits the annual World Happiness Report, the world's largest roundup of happiness data. A few years ago, he set out to explore the widely held belief among academics that we all born with a set point of happiness and that life events can only temporarily affect our happiness. Famous studies in the past have suggested that people who experience extreme life events like winning the lottery or becoming paralyzed largely return to their inborn happiness levels within a year or so. In other words, the argument went both good things like a rise, promotion, getting married and the bad things like getting fired, getting divorced or losing a loved one tend to have only temporary effects on our happiness. But in examining 
400,000 life satisfaction responses in Canada, John and his colleagues noticed something different. Canada is a pretty happy place, landing sixth overall in 2016 world rankings. On a scale of 1 to 10, Canadians give themselves an 8.1. Over the past 40 years, surveys have followed immigrants from more than 100 countries who have moved to Canada. They included people from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe, places where people reported much lower levels of happiness than people in Canada do. Remarkably, John and his colleagues discovered that no matter where they came from, within just a few years of arriving in Canada, they began to report the happiness levels close to those of their newly adapted home, no matter their class, gender age, or profession. All they did was move to Canada. It's a study that tells us a lot about what happened to the friends I met in Denmark. I recently phoned Erwin's from my home in Minneapolis. It was early evening in Aalborg, and they had just finished dinner. In the months that had passed since I had last seen him, Erwin's had secured a long-term contract to write computer code. Now that you have the job, I asked, how happy are you? Remember how I told you that in Latvia I couldn't even see tomorrow, he replied. Now I can see a week of Sundays. Lessons from Denmark. The happiness trifecta. Denmark excels in almost every facet of happiness. Not only embodying a culture of purpose, but also consistently ranking at or near the top of every major list for the other two stands, both pleasure, experience happiness, and pride, evaluative happiness. Here, the government has cleared a life path for its citizen. They, by and large, don't have to worry about paying for health care, education, or retirement, so they are free to pursue jobs they love and to enjoy plenty of recreation time. It's a place where people can discover their passions and put them to work every day so dance not only do well and feel good, they also live deeply fulfilling lives. They have achieved this happiness trifecta largely because as nation they got a jump on the rest of the world in terms of happiness fund fundamentals. Denmark was the first country to educate farmers' daughters, 1860s, give women voting rights, 1915. Their folk schools were world's first to give peasants liberal arts education. Their labor unions were among the first to assure workers living wage. In fact, Denmark's free education, health care, and retirement policies largely flow from this innovation. Denmark, purposeful flavor of happiness, teaches us that once our basic needs – food, shelter, health care, education, mobility – are covered, we should focus on pursuits that fuel the soul rather than fill out bank accounts or flatter our egos. Here are a few ideas on how to make that happen. First, avoid the status trap. Dance are famously egalitarian. Their gentleven, gentleven ethos assures that the tallest tree gets cut down. Ambition is not admired. Wearing designer labels is frowned upon. Few have too much and even fewer have too little. As the writer NSF 
Grundvik expressed it. As a result, dance are not attempted by status-rich jobs as they are by those that engage their interest and talents, those that ultimately drive satisfaction and encourage flow. So someone who loves to build furniture might not be as tempted by the prestige of lawyering. Dance are more likely to spend their extra money on a vacation or a piece of art rather than designer dresses or luxury cars. Their neighbors occupy the same social class as they do, so they are less likely to be stressed about keeping up with the Genesis. Lessons Contrary to what your real estate agent might tell you, don't buy the cheapest house on the block, or on the other hand, the biggest Mac mansion you can find. Rather, consider purchasing an average home relative to your financial situation and lifestyle needs. Create a group of friends who are at a roughly the same class and income level as you. Avoid luxury malls, mailing lists, websites, and any other places that are subtly reminded of the material goods that you are missing. Don't linger on Facebook where temptation to compare yourself with idealized profiles abounds. Consider volunteering your time to help people who have less than you. You'll feel better about your own lot in life. Second, favor handlebars over the steering wheel. Perhaps more than anyone else in the world, Dan's have embraced a culture of cycling. Ever since urban architect Jan Gale started redesigning Copenhagen in 1970s to favor bicycles, people have been riding them to work, to their favorite restaurants or to the homes of their friends. Bicycles are the primary mode of transportation for most people under 30. Each day, 50% of Copenhagen citizens collectively cycle some 9 1,000 miles. That means they are staying in better shape 932,000 miles. That means they are staying in better shape, avoiding obesity and shedding stress all on their commute to work. Meanwhile, they are saving money they would otherwise spend on cars. Fewer people are dying in auto accidents, and their air quality is better. All of this contributes to their happiness. Lessons. Buy a bike that thrills you, and you'll be more excited about riding it. Get a map of local bike trails, and try a few roads for weekend recreation, most important, see if you can bicycle to work or bus and bike. Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman found that one of the things the most hate on a day-to-day -day basis is commuting to and from our jobs in our cars. Third, join a club. By some estimates, more than 90% of Danish adults belong to a club or association among the highest rates in the world. Often subsidized by the government, membership in clubs, everything from model trains and cold water swimming to competitive rabbit jumping provides a non-work outlet for people to pursue their passions. It also provides means for those famously reserved people to boost their social interaction. 
lessons, take an internal inventory of your interests and passions, and then make an effort to join a relevant club, sports team, or service organization. Give priority to organizations whose members are like you in age, values, and interests, and you'll create new friendships to boot. Fourth, empower your children. Danish children are often full-fledged members of the family from above age five. They have a say in what the family eats and where they go on vacation and in a distribution of course. At school, they call their teachers by their first names. The curriculum focuses on teamwork, building consensus and empathy, as opposed to road memory and test scores. Lessons. Treat your children like little adults. Eat meals together. Give them a say when planning vacations. Give honest answers to their hard question. Make them do chores, but let them decide which ones. Ask them to help you cook. Avoid ultimatums, but rather give them choices with consequences. Fifth. Focus on trust. Trust is stronger predictor of nation's happiness than any other factor except, except GDP. And Danes have lots of it. Denmark routinely tops the list of world's most trustworthy countries. People there trust politicians, the police and their neighbors. They have the lowest corruption rates in the world. And not coincidentally, Forbes rated Denmark the number one place to do business in 2015. Lessons. Then choosing a job and place to live. Favored trustworthy people, bosses, co-workers, neighbors, over other factors. In building your own social network, Remember that trustworthy people attract trustworthy people. So, make it a point to be trustworthy yourself. Show up on time. Keep your word and act with integrity. Six, eat quality, not quantity. Denmark has more Michelin star restaurants than any other Scandinavian country. Back breakfast is rye bread, cheese, jam, and coffee. Lunch is a simple open-faced sandwich. Dinner used to be fish, pickled herring was a favorite. But in recent years, Danish cuisine has evolved to include organic, locally sourced foods, exquisitely prepared. So dining out becomes more of an Epicurean adventure than a belly feeling exercise. In contrast, when Americans eat out, they tend to consume about 200 extra calories than they would if they stayed home. Lessons. Design your menu based on the quality of the food you are eating. Choose fresh and local fruits and vegetables. Eat out less often, but when you do, make it special. Seventh, take your time in school. Danes don't start school until age six and often don't end their academic career until they're 30. Along the way, they may travel, take a year off to try a profession and switch majors. By the time they graduate, they are likely to have found a career that they love, not just one that pays. They have a variety of life experiences and a rich liberal arts education. Indeed, among the happiest dance are those in their late 20s and early 30s who are in the marriage market and transitioning from school to their first job. Lessons. 
Go to a school you can afford. Take liberal arts classes. Take year off to travel before graduating. Don't rush into a job, mortgage and debt. Eighth, take six weeks of vacation. The Danes take at least four weeks a year to travel and often take two months. They will uh, summer uh, in southern Europe or spend weeks in a time at a time at the sea. Researcher in the Danish Statistic Office told me that the more Danes vacation, the more value they gain. After six weeks of vacation, they actually feel more satisfied to get back to work and become productive again. Lessons. Don't be lured by the notion that you take your dream vacation later in life. Use all your vacation time and negotiate for more until you are getting about six weeks off. No one on her deathbed wishes she had worked more. 9. Consider co-housing. Denmark is home to more than 100 co-housing projects, or Bofales Cup. In each case, about 30 families live in connected homes that form a long row or a circle around a common area. As a rule, you can walk into any house and announce yourself. Usually you are greeted by friends, but if no one answers, you don't stay. Kids are completely free range. They end up at each other's houses and roam the grounds and surrounding woods freely. The co-housing arrangement strikes the perfect balance between private and public, as residents can be as social as they want, although circumstances nudge them into minimum uh, threshold of socialization. Even introverts are happier, studies have shown, when they are around people rather than alone. Lessons Make a point of moving into a friendly neighborhood with people who share your stage in life. Get to know your neighbors, organize a potluck, Help start a communal garden if you have children. Make a deal with other parents to take turns taking care of each other's kids. If you are interested in finding co-housing in the United States, investigate the co-housing association, cohousing.org. Tenth, plan purchases, saver shopping. The Danish government provides all citizens with health care, education, and adequate retirement. On the other hand, people in Denmark pay some of the highest tax rates in the world. This leaves them secure but not flush. When they do have disposable income, they tend to carefully shop for months or even years, severing the process. Their homes tend to be small by American standards, uncluttered and punctuated with a few beautiful things, an elegant light fixture, piece of furniture, a picture. They derive happiness both from the selection process and from enjoying a few high-quality things for years. Lessons. Avoid the big box stores and cheap merchandise. Clean out your house, minimize clutter, make fewer purchases, preferring high-quality purchases from craftsmen over low-cost commercial stuff. 11th. Carp retirement. The happiest dance are retirees. But retirement in Denmark doesn't mean repose. They tend to stay active. They travel, belong to clubs and organizations, spend their summers at garden cottages where they socialize with their neighbors. Lessons Maximize savings now to plan for early, long, satisfying retirement. 
Think of it as your next career. 12. Work fewer than 40 hours per week. Dance tend to show up at their jobs, get their work done, go home as soon as they can. They work an average of 37 hours a week, which leaves them time to participate in club activities, cook with their families, exercise, or do other things more gratifying than just doing more work. Lessons. Choose a job that will cover your basic needs, but allow you to work fewer than 40 hours per week. This can often be accomplished with job flex plans, combining part-time jobs, working for yourself, or negotiating with your boss. In the Blue Zones offices, employees struck a deal that lets them go home at noon on Fridays during the summer. Thirteenth, create a hige room. Hige roughly translates as coziness, and traditionally this very Danish word describes the feeling you get when you tuck in around candlelit table with good drinks, friends, and conversation. I have also been with families who achieve a daily sense of hige by designating one electronics-free room where the families can sit together, pursue hobbies, play games, read, play an instrument or study. Lessons Create your own hige room, remove TVs, electronic games and clocks. Line the room with books or shelves holding pictures and objects that inspire you to pursue your passions. Put a table in the middle that will accommodate your entire family. At the very least, have one room in your house where you can turn off any electronic devices, light a few candles, and focus on fellowship and conversation. We completed reading of the chapter called Happiness in Denmark from the book The Blue Zones of Happiness by Dan Butner, read by a doctor of biology, Alex Sopko.